good evening everyone a warm welcome from the collaborative learning cafe my name is frederick and this evening i have this job of introducing our speaker father josie a demelo who who will be uh, addressing us this evening father joseph anthony demelo also known as josie joined the karnataka province of the society of jesus in the year 1988 he was ordained in 2001 after that he has been assistant novice director in mount saint joseph bengaluru from 2002 till 2005 he obtained his masters and doctorate in spiritual theology from the university of comillas madrid spain he was the program coordinator of prerna the ignatian spiritual center at bengaluru from 2012 to 2015 he was also the coordinator of the masters program in ignatian spirituality at nyanadeep vidyapeet pune from 2016 to 18 and taught in the same institute that is jdv from 2015 to 2018 he has been the secretary for the commission on ignatian charism in south asia for 6 years He is currently the socius to the provincial of Karnataka since January 2019, and he resides at Dola Mandir in Bangalore. A warm welcome, Father. Over to you. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Am I audible? Yes, Father. Okay. First of all, thanks to Father Roland for inviting me to this session. and also to mr frederick noronna for introducing me and for his words of welcome we are in the ignition year therefore i thought of correlating the experience of ignatius with the present time that is the time of the pandemic or the covid moment so i will make my presentation i will show you the slides okay So this is my presentation the title of my presentation is Ignatius of Loyola turning a crisis into an opportunity and I'll be covering the following sub themes first of all a few words about ignatian year second one is about our context today we are living in a context of crisis third one will be on ignatius of loyola turning a crisis into an opportunity and finally conclusion so first of all first one is about ignatian year we are celebrating ignatian year from the 20th of may 2021 already we have begun the celebration and it will go on till the 31st of july 2022 and the theme of this celebration or ignition year is to see all things new in christ this is the focus of the celebration or of the ignition year what do we celebrate first of all we celebrate the fifth centenary of the battle of pamplona which took place on the 20th of may 1521 and so we began the ignition year on the 20th of may 2021 marking the 5th centenary of that event of that battle of pamplona we are also celebrating the 5th centenary of the book of the spiritual exercises that was written between 1522 and 1523 ignatius did the spiritual exercises in the cave of mandresa it comes closer to barcelona the place called mandresa and he not only did the spiritual exercises but he also wrote the spiritual exercises going once he went through that exercise experience then based on that experience he writes the book of the spiritual exercises therefore we are also celebrating the fifth centenary of this book what do we celebrate the third point here we are also celebrating the fourth centenary of the canonization of ignatius of loyola and francis xavier both of them were canonized on the 12th of march 
And so next year on the 12th of March, 2022, <coughs> we'll be celebrating the fourth centenary of the canonization of these two great saints. Now I'm coming to our context that is COVID-19. Friends, when you look at our context today, we experience the fragility of human life. We are so fragile, we are so vulnerable. And some of them, some of us were infected with COVID. And we know what it means to have that experience of COVID. And we also know some of our friends, some of our relatives <coughs> who were with us, today they are no more with us. And we could not even give them, give them a proper burial. And so we realize more and more the fragility of human life. And due to this COVID, there is another crisis that has happened in our country. There is growing unemployment and poverty. We are also going through a global health crisis. And especially we have experienced this during the second wave. Now people are talking about the third wave. And we do not know what is in store for us. And in the context of this health crisis, we also notice there is a vaccination divide. If you go to our rural areas, many people have not even taken the first dose. Whereas in the cities, people have already second, taken the second dose. And we notice there is a vaccination divide. There is a hesitation among people to go for vaccination. We also experience crisis in education system. First of all, we ask, what is education? Many of us are in online mode. And in online mode, normally we try to cover the syllabus. Now the question is, education means, is it only covering the syllabus or is it something more than that? What about the character formation? And we also ex notice in some of our rural areas, people are not able to have a mobile or some of them are having only one mobile, but in the families, they have four children and I visited some of the rural areas of Karnataka, and this has been my experience. At least 40% at least of our students, those who are in the rural areas, they are not able to attend classes. And so there is a crisis in education system. And we also notice there is anxiety and depression among youth due to various reasons, due to COVID, due to rise in employment and poverty. And so there is anxiety, depression, because we have to spend a lot of time inside our room. We are confined to our rooms, hardly any relationship with the outside world, with our friends. And so people have gone through anxiety, depression, and some of them also have ended their lives. On the other hand, there are also uh, lives of this crisis. We have learned something. First of all, friends, we have realized that we are interconnected beings. Before Corona, we were living in a fragmented reality. Today, we feel more and more that we need to work together. We need to collaborate with one another. And this has been our experience. And today, people of all religions are coming together to fight against this COVID. COVID has no religion. COVID attacks everybody. It attacks the rich and the poor. It attacks people of all states. It also attacks people of all religions. And therefore, today we need to come together to fight against this COVID. And that's what we have witnessed during both the first and the second wave. We also observe that there is a new religion called humanity that is emerging. Many good Samaritans have come forward. I'm sure in Goa, I notice here in Karnataka, Many of our youth, our students, our lay people have come together. People of different religions have come together and they say, let us give proper burial to everybody. We will not make distinction whether they are Christians, Hindus, Muslims, and they have distributed food to everybody. And so a new religion called humanity is emerging. We have also witnessed optimism in our youth. When we look at a crisis, we can be very pessimistic, but we have seen our youth coming forward, becoming very creative and somehow fighting against this COVID. This is what we have witnessed during this COVID time. And so in this context of crisis, 
what is our approach should be we can approach crisis thinking that it is a danger it is an impending ruin so we can be in fear and live in hopelessness but on the other hand we can also approach crisis looking at it as an opportunity it is a occasion for us to make a breakthrough and we we are sure that there is an opening ahead so we approach crisis with hope and optimism to my right there is a there is a picture there image there you can learn things from successes but you can learn even more things from failures turn crisis into opportunity and this is this will be my focus in my presentation now so to conclude this part of crisis we can look at crisis also from this image that i have put here you see this hairpin bend this road in this road there is a curve and crisis could be compared to a curve and we know curve is not the end of the road you see that hairpin bend that is there the curve that is there that is not the end of the road for that jeep it is a beginning of a new direction and this is what we notice in the life of ignatius and this is what we have been experienced during this covid times this has been a crisis but this has given us a new normal it has given us a new direction new orientation new perspective change of heart and therefore this crisis can be a new direction a new it can give new meaning to our life now i come to the person of ignatius of loyola uh, here i will take more time turning a crisis into an opportunity i suppose all of you are with me first when we look at the life of ignatius first of all i would like to highlight the crisis moment we see series of crises in the life of ignatius between 1517 to 1521 and first of all the first crisis <clears throat> the loss of job ignatius was born in the year 1491 and in 1507 he was 16 year old boy and at the age of 16 if you notice he already lost his mother when he was a small boy then he was taken care by his sister in law magdalena and at the age of 16 the chief treasurer of the kingdom of castilla his name is juan velasquez de cuellar he requests the ignatius father he requests ignatius father to send his son to arevalo and therefore at the age of 16 in 1507 ignatius was sent to arevalo to work as a scribe of juan velasquez de cuellar the chief treasurer of the kingdom of castilla and he was working under king ferdinand let me make it clear there is a kingdom of castilla in spanish we say castilla and the king is king ferdinand and under him there is a chief treasurer and his name is juan velasquez de cuellar juan velasquez de cuellar and under him ignatius is working as a scribe and what is the work that was assigned to him it was a career of public administration political intricacies and basically ignatius was not going there as a soldier but very fact he was in public administration handling of arms was part of that work so therefore he was also uh, trained in arms now ignatius is exposed to a new world view to a new perspective remember he is in the kingdom of castilla he is closely in contact with king ferdinand and now he is exposed to a world of name and fame and that filled his aspiration during this period now what happens in 1516 king ferdinand of castilla dies and who comes after that king charles the first succeeds him and this new king charles the first had differences with the chief treasurer 
Juan Velasquez de Cuellar about the wealth of the kingdom. And because of these differences, the new king, Charles I, expels Cuellar from the kingdom. And soon after that, he dies. And a tragedy strikes in the life of Ignatius at the age of 26. That was in 1517. What is this tragedy? Ignatius was suddenly left orphaned with no resources because it was Juan Velasquez de Cuella who took Ignatius as his scribe. Now he was expelled. Along with him, Ignatius also was expelled. And unfortunately, very next year, this chief treasurer died. Now Ignatius was suddenly left orphaned with no resources. Now he was an unemployed youth, no job. He had no patron. He had nothing. It was the beginning of a crisis. We move to the second crisis. It is the failure in the battlefield. That is at the Battle of Pamplona on the 20th of May, 1521. Now what happens? I said Ignatius was without a job. Now the wife of the chief treasurer, Don Juan Velasquez de Cuellar, his wife Maria de Velasco gave Ignatius 500 coins and two horses and sent him to the Duke of Nahera, who took Inigo into his service. Now Ignatius literally goes from the central part of Spain to the northern part of Spain. And you can imagine what he was going through. He is without any job. There may be uncertainty. Let us put ourselves into the shoes of Ignatius. And now Ignatius goes to this Duke of Nahera. And here in Inigo as a knight was an officer of the Viceroy's Guard in Navarra. Now there is a battle between the French force and the Spanish force. And in the French force, there were 13,000 soldiers. And the Spanish force had only 1,000. See the difference. And Ignatius was part of the Spanish force. And the chief military officer says, let us surrender because they outnumber us. The French army is so big. So we are not a match to them. But we notice for Ignatius, Spanish kingdom was everything. And Ignatius says, let us die rather than surrender. We will fight to the death. For Ignatius, surrendering was not an option. It was dying because if we die, that shows our loyalty to our Spanish kingdom. And in that whole context of that battle, a cannonball struck Ignatius and his light right leg was shattered and left leg injured. And we have another crisis, the second crisis in the life of Ignatius. And today we Jesuits and many people today, we call this as a cannonball moment. Cannonball moment means a crisis moment. And this is what happened to Ignatius, the cannonball moment. It took place on the 20th of May, 1521. Now there is a third crisis, failure in relationship. It happens actually in 1521. Ignatius, because he was given to the worldly desires, he was given to name and fame, gave importance to his external appearance. And we notice here, his right leg is shattered. And this is taken from the autobiography of Ignatius, number four. And it says here, and his bones having knit together, one below the knee was left riding on another, which made the leg shorter. Already he could see his leg was shorter. The bone protruded so much that it was an ugly business. Ignatius gave so much importance to his external appearance. Now he sees that one leg becoming shorter is an ugly business. And besides, the bone protruded so much that it was an ugly business. He could not bear such a thing because he was set on a worldly career and thought that this would deform him. See the word deform him. He is worried about the external deformity. 
And he asked the surgeons if it could be cut away. And he also says, I am ready to go any amount of pain, but I want to, I do not want to have any deformity. Why is this? Because Ignatius was madly in love with a girl called, lady called Catalina. He doesn't mention the name of that lady, but the scholars say perhaps that is the lady by name Catalina. First, let us read this passage from his own autobiography, number six. He says, of the many foolish ideas that occurred to him, occurred to him is Ignatius, one had taken such a hold on his heart that he was absorbed in thinking about it for two and three and four hours without realizing it. He imagined what he would do in the service of a certain lady, that lady is Catalina, the means he would take so he could go to the place where she lived, the quips, the words he would address to her, the feats of arms he would perform in her service. Notice this. He became so infatuated with this that he did not consider how impossible of attainment it would be because the lady was not of ordinary nobility. Ignatius says that lady took hold of his heart and he was all the time absorbed in thinking about it for two, three, and four hours without realizing it. Now, this is what Ignatius was in love with a lady called Catalina, who was of great nobility. And this is basically infatuation, because that lady was, was not in love with Ignatius. Now his one leg is shorter, and man, Ignatius gave so much importance to his external appearance, now he realized this deformity will bring an end to his relationship. He gives up his romantic dreams. And Ignatius comes across another disaster, another crisis, the third crisis, failure in relationship. So we notice here, one by one, the dreams of Ignatius are shattered. It appears that he has reached a dead end in his life. This is the end of his life. This is not the beginning. So far, he thought about himself and he said, I am the master of my life. I decide about everything. Now all this beginning to shatter. The self-glory beginning to crumble. And this was truly a crisis moment. Now we make a short pause. And I'm inviting you to reflect on this question. Recall any one crisis moment in your life. As I share my reflections, it is better we also connect ourselves. We uh, uh, connect this presentation with our own life story. And I'm sure some of us might have gone through some crisis, some tragedy in our lives. Crisis moment could be death of a dear one sickness, loss of job, financial crisis, crisis in relationship, crisis in studies, etc. Cannonball moments are experiences that force us to stop how we are living and invite us to live in a new way. This is very beautiful. Cannonball moments, crisis moments are experiences that force us to stop how we are living and invite us to live in a new way. In the context of COVID, a new normal emerges. What is your cannonball moment? Now I move on to the second point here. The sifting moment at Loyola. You are quite familiar with these pictures. To my right, we have a strainer, I suppose you can call strainer, 
there is sand and also there are stones and the fine sand goes down and only the stones remain and ignatius when he was in loyola it was a sifting moment for him and this is the focus of the second point now ignatius was in pamplona during that battle on the 20th of may his opponents the french soldiers they looked at ignatius and they looked at him with admiration they said we salute this man because he was able to withstand the enemies though the enemies were 13000 and the spanish soldiers were 1000 still ignatius was daring courageous and therefore they had great admiration and instead of killing ignatius because they could have killed him and that was a near death experience for ignatius they take care of him they take care of him first of all there itself in pamplona then they bring ignatius to his hometown somehow in failures god is intervening in the life of ignatius there's an intervention of god now ignatius is in loyola he is confined to his room it is a lockdown period maybe the lord was telling him telling ignatius lockdown means slow down lockdown means it's a time to introspect now during this lockdown period in loyola ignatius wanted to kill time and how did he want to kill time he wanted to kill time by reading books on romance and chivalry because that was the world in which he was living unfortunately his sister-in-law tells him that she doesn't have such books and she gives him these two books holy books one is on the life of christ and the other one is on the lives of saints and these two books were given to ignatius to read and as ignatius was reading these books maybe initially he was reluctant but as he was reading these books a holy desire surfaces and as he was reading certain questions come to his mind if saint france of assisi and saint dominic of guzman can become saints why can't i if they can become great persons why can't i and this lockdown connects him to the inner world this is the beauty of it so far he was focusing on the external world now slowly ignatius is becoming aware of his inner world and it was a time for introspection and he realizes the thoughts on romance initially brought him delight but later on sadness the thoughts on imitating great persons brought him great joy though it appeared to be difficult it brought great consolation and you notice the difference one thoughts one thought brings him sadness whereas the other thought brings him joy and consolation and this was a sifting moment we are very good at external exploration and even the time of ignatius we know columbus discovered america we say it was the time of Colum uh, during the time of ignatius it happened they discovered external things explored the external reality but here ignatius is exploring the inner world and it is it was a sifting moment for ignatius now here i would like to spend some time focusing on the process from thoughts to choices ignatius reads these books life of christ and lives of saints and as he was reading these books certain thoughts surface basically thoughts about saints and their great deeds and those thoughts fill him with joy and consolation those thoughts elicit feelings and along with those feelings he has certain desires and he says if they can become saints i too want to be a saint and that leads him to a decision and what is that decision these saints also had gone to jerusalem and jerusalem is a place where jesus lived 
where he died and where he rose. And Ignatius says, I too want to go to Jerusalem. I want to live and die there. So he makes a decision to go to Jerusalem. See the process that is involved. Thoughts, feelings, desires leading to decision. <clears throat> Let's connect it to our life during the time of COVID. What thoughts did I have about God? Some of us might have had very pleasant thoughts about God. Pleasant means, yes, I notice a very painful reality, but I know God is present. God will not, will not let us down. And therefore, such thoughts brought feelings Pleasant feelings. What kind of feelings? I was hopeful. I was bold, courageous. I was not pessimistic because God is present. God will not leave us at this moment. Our God is a, is a God who walks with us, who journeys with us. And what is the desire? Desire is to remain close to God. So such feelings of hope and courage they brought holy desires. I want to remain close to God. And how do I want to remain close to God? That is by reciting prayers, by, uh, no, by attending rosaries or attending adorations. Most of these things are online, but still I want to be in contact with God. And this is how we led our lives during the time of COVID. It all matters what thoughts we have and what feelings we go through, and what desires and what decisions we make. Similarly, let's say we had unpleasant thoughts, and it is quite natural to have these unpleasant thoughts. Some of us might have asked, where is God? Why God has abandoned us? Why God is punishing us? So we might have had certain thoughts like this. And what could be some of the feelings, unpleasant feelings? anger, despair. Some of us might have been restless and that might have led us to not to think about God. And some of us might have said, I have nothing to do about God. I do not want to see any people who talk about God. I do not want to watch any, any channels which speak about God. And that, will, that might have led us to cut off our relationship from God. No prayer, no mass absolutely nothing and it is quite normal quite natural to have these things but it's good for us to see the whole process that we have gone in we have uh, experienced thoughts feelings desires and the decision so friends when we look at the life of ignatius and our life it is not that at one moment i get only pleasant thoughts and pleasant feelings, next time unpleasant. Sometimes there's a mixture of all these things, pleasant, unpleasant thoughts. Feelings also pleasant, I feel very happy, joyful, and sometimes I may be feeling very restless. And I might be having also anger, hurt, and desires also, sometimes holy desires. I want to be close to God, close to my neighbor. Sometimes I may remain aloof from God. I may remain far away from my neighbors. I want to disconnect my relationships from my neighbor. And also that will lead us to sometimes life promoting choices and life destroying choices. Take, for example, our own youth, what they might be going through sometimes, especially with regard to their relationship with their parents. If they have a pleasant thought about their parents, there are pleasant feelings. And they say, no, I need to respect my parents. I want to be with them. I want to be close to them. And some of that leads them to make life promoting choices. On the other hand, if they have very negative thoughts or we can say unpleasant thoughts, I don't like my parents. They are always uh, there to catch me. They want to punish me. They don't love me. If a youth has such thoughts, that will lead to feelings like, you know, I'm angry with my parents. I don't want, I have nothing to do with my parents. I just want to remain away from my parents and feelings of anger. And sometimes we might be recalling some hurt feelings. 
and also feeling that they don't love me, they don't, they don't take care of me. And what is the desire? Desire is, I don't want to go home. I do not want to have any relationship with my parents because they don't give me freedom. All these words are youth use. And what is the decision? And sometimes they make life-destroying decisions. And so Ignatius teaches us something very beautiful, that we need to pay attention to our inner world because we experience, all of us experience this pull, pull towards the pleasant, the unpleasant, pull towards the beautiful, the ugly, beautiful, pull towards the good and the evil. All of us experience this pull and a battle goes on within each one of us. Ignatius was focusing on the external battle. Now he says conquering this inner world is far more difficult than conquering the external world. And there is a battle that goes on within each one of us. And coming to the last part of this second point, therefore, what do you feed in matters a lot. What do I feed in? And we have something called the examination of consciousness at the end of the day, maybe also before, uh, uh, during noon, noon time, we can do this. And we need to check what do I feed in? What are my interior movements? What goes on within me? What are my thoughts? What are my feelings, desires? And where is it leading me? Check the process from thoughts to choices. Some thoughts, they lead me to life promoting choices and others to life destroying. And there is a need to sift once in the world. Beware, the unpleasant world within can lead one to life destroying choices. In other words, if there is a toxic environment within me that can lead me to life destroying choices. And therefore we need to be extremely careful. And this sifting is a mantra for mental health and well-being. And we notice friends in the life of Ignatius, crisis moments we know are inevitable. They can propel us to new heights or flatten us to the ground. And we look at Ignatius, I think he was not flat on the ground, rather he was able to rise up and he was able to rise up to the new heights. We pause here and we ask this question for ourselves. What were my predominant thoughts, questions, doubts, feelings, desires, pleasant or unpleasant during the pandemic? Could be about anything, about life, about my job, about my neighbors, about my relations, relatives, about God. What were my predominant thoughts? What was bothering me all the time during the pandemic? Have I made life promoting choices or life destroying choices? Have I made life promoting choices or life destroying choices? Which was predominant in me during the time of crisis? The third one, seeing a higher purpose. On deeper introspection, Ignatius realized that he had survived for a purpose. I want to underline this word purpose. He is using the same will, power, willpower and tenacity to rise from the ruins, to put together his broken dreams and shattered ambitions. As a soldier, he had that willpower and that willpower still there. He has not lost that willpower, that passion he has got. Now that passion is for a particular purpose. Ignatius begins his journey towards the unknown. I said he wanted to go to Jerusalem. Now he begins his journey from Loyola as a pilgrim in search of God, in search of meaning and purpose in his life. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Ignatius went to Montserrat where he made his general confession and in Montserrat, he placed his sword and dagger at the altar of Our Lady. And he stripped off, stripped off all his garments and gave them to a beggar 
and in turn he wore the garment of the beggar you see so far he was wearing that soldier's dress now he is wearing the garment of the beggar now from monserrat ignatius goes to manresa a place called manresa and he reached manresa on march 25 1522 and in fact ignatius said gone there to stay only for a few days but once again god had other plan for ignatius and ignatius stays there for 11 months and during this time he does the spiritual exercises and how does he spend his time daily he spent 7 hours in prayer now it is a voluntary lockdown it is not involuntary he decides he wants to spend time in prayer he had grown his hair and did not cut his nails you see a contradiction a man who focused so much on his external appearance he did not want to have any deformity now he is he has grown his hair and he did not he does not cut his nails he was clad in his tunic of rough cloth the sackcloth man people used to call him the sackcloth man in mandresa He started begging for his daily sustenance. He served the sick in the hospitals. He ate no meat and drank no wine. He was a man on a search. He was not bothered about what other people are talking about him, because he was a man on a search. and i'm reminded of a, a quote from the church fathers especially the desert fathers it is said it is easy to remove the monk from the world but it is far more difficult to remove the world from the monk it is easy to remove the monk from the world but it is far more difficult to remove the world from the monk i suppose you get this point yes we all leave our families and all that it is easy for a monk to come to a monastery but it is far more difficult to remove the world from the monk it is need not it need not be only for religious but also for us as lay people yes we have to remove the world from us what is that world world of self centeredness world of jealousy world of hatred this work of removing the world from the monk or from us is a journey of struggles doubts questions and confusion even at this point ignatius felt like committing suicide but one thing is sure despite such turmoil ignatius held on to god he was sure that god will show the way ignatius was faithful to his prayer ignatius was faithful to his confession ignatius is faithful to all his spiritual duties he doesn't give up because he knew god will show the way and you are quite familiar with this song by don moen god will make a way where there seems to be no way he works in ways we cannot see he will make a way for me perhaps this was the experience of ignatius now in this process when he was there for 11 months his interior eyes were opened he gets an insight into his life if you talk to a youth they would say this was a aha moment in the life of ignatius he receives an insight <clears throat> and what is that insight first of all he becomes aware god is like a teacher for me i am a child so far it looked like ignatius wanted to conquer god he wanted to conquer holiness he wanted to fasting penance looked like he wanted to conquer everything even the spiritual world but now he realizes after going through this process of 11 months god is a teacher i am a child more than having this conquering mentality like a soldier i need to have a receptive mentality like a child i need to be open to god i need to allow god to work in me now he is getting in touch with the core of his being and now he is captivated by a new meaning system a new normal is emerging in the life of ignatius 
slowly from the world of fragmented reality, he comes to an interconnected reality. He realizes more and more, God, human and cosmos are interconnected. And that's what we see when he says, we are called to love and serve the divine majesty in all things. Love and serve the divine majesty in all things. All things indicates cosmos. Love and serve. Who has to love and serve? I as human being, human and the divine in all things. Divine. That means God. God, human and cosmos. We are interconnected. And there is also a movement from self-centeredness to other-centeredness. And so he realizes, I am not the master of my life. Someone else is leading me. This was the aha moment in the life of Ignatius. And this insight taught him the why of life, the purpose of life. And therefore, there is a movement from self-centeredness, self-glory to other-centeredness. Now he realizes there is a meaning in living for others. There is a meaning in helping one's neighbors. And so even studies are not meant for my, my glory. Rather, studies are meant in order to help others. We gather friends. He calls them friends in the Lord. And bringing together these friends is not for a selfish purpose. It is to be at the service of others. So far, in all that he did, Ignatius was the center. But now something else is the focus. There is a higher purpose. At Pampelona, Inigo's leg was shattered. And at Mandresa, Ignatius' ego was shattered. He began to, therefore, he began to see things differently. He began to see things with the eyes of God. The question here for us would be, after COVID, have you begun to see the higher purpose in life? After COVID, have you begun to see the higher purpose in life? Is there a new meaning system emerging in your life? For Ignatius, earlier it was the self-glory. That, that was the meaning system. Now it is God's glory, serving for others. That is the new meaning system. And the last one, friends, seeing all things new in Christ. Now, after Mandresa, Ignatius was convinced that God was working within him, first of all. And therefore, I said, no, there are thoughts, feelings, then desires, and then he makes a decision. And Ignatius calls this, all these thoughts, feelings, and desires as interior movements. And for Ignatius, that is the language of God. God tells me, God speaks to me through my interior movements. And Ignatius was convinced that God was working within him. But also he was convinced that God was working in the world as he was a laboring God. Because everything has come from God and everything is going back to God. And God is working and laboring in this, in this world. And what is my work? What is my mission? My mission is to co-labor with God in, the, in his mission of establishing his reign. So that is my work. I am called to collaborate in the mission of God. And therefore, there is a new spirituality. What was the predominant spirituality till the 16th century? The predominant spirituality was the monastic spirituality. Run away from the world. World is bad. And there was a divide, body and the soul, the spirit and matter. But now Ignatius says, the world is created by God. It is God, it is in the world where God abides. And therefore, he speaks of a world affirming spirituality. And so he says, we, are, we need to love and serve God in all things. And what is important here? Seeing all things new in Christ, I can look at the world from my own self-centeredness, from my own selfishness. But here I'm invited to see things with the eyes of Christ with my faith. And here, one needs to have the ability to go beyond what meets the eye. I'm going through crisis. What I see is crisis. 
But if, you, if I go beyond what meets the eye, I may be seeing the hand of God. God is present there. And therefore, we can say it is seeing a saint in a sinner, seeing a butterfly in a caterpillar, or seeing a flower in a bud. So when we look at reality with the eyes of Christ, we are able to go beyond what meets the eye. We are not just looking at objects. We are looking at God's creatures. And each creature is the manifestation of the divine. And so we are invited to find God in the busyness of our lives. And so Ignatius says, we are called to be, not Ignatius, but Nadal, one of the early companions of Ignatius, he said, we are called to be contemplatives in action. And hence, the world becomes our monastery. Monastery is not far away from in the desert. Rather, it is in the marketplace. The world becomes our monastery. And this is how we are called to see all things new in Christ. Our families, our communities, our church, and the, our world at large. And to conclude, these are the four points that I covered. Isis moment, sifting moment, seeing the higher purpose moment, seeing all things new in Christ moment. And the conclusion, Ignatius was limping all through his life. It was the reminder of the cannonball. It was the reminder of a tragedy and a crisis. Limping was also a pointer that Ignatius was not the master of his life. Someone else was guiding his destiny. Limping, that means it was an awful experience for Ignatius, something beautiful emerged. And we know the beautiful thing that emerged, the change of heart. Similarly, limping could be a crisis and we are invited to turn that into an opportunity. And when it becomes an opportunity, we know we are able to serve God, we are able to serve others, we become transformed person. The crisis moment was truly a life transforming event for Ignatius and it could be a life transforming event for all of us. Thank you. Yes, uh, now the audience is one second. Okay, so anybody among the audience, if you all have any questions, you can just unmute yourself and ask them. You can also share your reflections. Need not be only questions, anything, feel free. Well, I guess uh, to speak. Fine. I now request Mr. Frederick Narona to kindly take over. Savio, there were one or two questions that had come up for Father. Could uh, could we raise that, please? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. You can read it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Father, uh, just a moment. Huh? Yes. Someone is asking about online courses uh, on the spiritual uh, exercises of Saint Ignatius. Okay. Whether they are available. I'm not very sure about the online courses. Uh, I see there's Joseph Cardozo. Maybe you can ask him from Goa province. I'm not very sure whether there are online courses. But there is an online site, you know, Ignatian Spirituality. But I'm not very sure whether they offer online courses. I'm not very sure. Since I'm now very much in India, I don't have much contact. Right. Uh, but in India, we don't have anywhere online courses. Right, right. You know? okay, yeah. right Father. Even that IgnatianSpirituality.com, there is some slash online. There is some some uh, link to that. 
Yeah. And I think a uh, Google search is throwing up some results uh, in general. Okay. Uh, there's a request from Edith Melo Furtado who is uh, requesting. I think this is to the Goa province. Kindly organize effectively the learning and practice of the uh, you know uh, exercises of Saint Ignatius, spiritual exercises of Saint Ignatius. Yeah. Uh, would anyone else like to come in? Feel free to. I know Father Clifford. I think your uh, Father Clifford or someone wants to say something. If if not, then a, a question from me, Father. Yes. Uh, yes. I'm just I'm just I I was much impressed by this quote from Pope Francis, who says that you pray for the hungry, then you feed them, and this is how prayer works. Okay. So so Father, what is your advice to us? On the interaction between thought and action in today's world. Uh, could you repeat, uh, Mr. Frederick? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I was quoting Pope Francis, yeah. whose uh, famous quote is, "You pray for the hungry, yes. Then you feed them, and this yeah. is how prayer works." So, yeah. what is your advice to us in terms of the interaction between uh, thought and action in today's world? Yeah, that's a very beautiful uh, quote from Pope Francis. It's not enough to pray, but your love should be in deeds. That means you must also feed them. So, what I say here, now for example, Ignatius read the lives of saints. We'll have a lot of good thoughts, pleasant thoughts, but I think we must put into practice. I'm not saying we need to become, uh, you know, like uh, uh, earlier this use, uh, I want to become another Christ. Today we say, I want to be Christ-like. That means I want to put into practice some of the values of Christ. So I think there should be a resonance between you know, my inner world and what happens, you know, what I do. I'm basically speaking from a, towards uh, becoming a Christian, you know, better Christian, a better human being. So from that angle, you know, it is not enough. Sometimes I come to the church, I have very pleasant thoughts, good thoughts, but our difficulty is to put into practice. A lot of fear is there, whether should I do that, should I not do that? So I think there should be a resonance between what goes on within me, especially the pleasant thoughts, pleasant feelings. But also I think I need to put into practice. So I would say that kind of connection. Similarly here, if I think about the hungry and all that, I need to also feed them. I need to do something about them. It is not enough to just to pray in the church. But at times, no, uh, our spirituality is confined to only to the church or within the four walls of my family. But uh, externally, we are not showing it. So that also challenge, but also we have Christians who are doing social work. You know, that side also is there. So each one has to see where do I stand in this. Can I ask? Hello. Yeah, Hello. please, please. Hello. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yes, sister. Go ahead. Yeah. You know what, uh, Father? My question is: in the spiritual life, as you progress. Uh, there are several moments of conversion that take place. Yeah. And each time you're hit with something uh, uh, about being invited to change your life, would that also be a can cannonball moment? There need not be a once for all cannonball moment. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, it's very important. When I made a presentation, it looked like you have first one, second, another moment. But I think. Conversion is ongoing. Conversion is ongoing. Some of us may not have a tragedy or a crisis like Ignatius, but I'm sure we will have some kind of aha moment or some kind of change of perspective or change of, uh, especially in the time of COVID, some people have told me they have to reset their priorities. Before COVID, it was more of uh, my job, my work, uh, sorry, my job or uh, uh, no, uh, my health. But now the health of my family, more than my job, it is uh, uh, in the sense of relationship. For some people, family became important. So more than job, family. For some people, wealth was important. Now they say health is important. So even this resetting of priorities or change of perspective, change of worldview also could be an experience of conversion. So we need to be alert. We should not expect no like a big turning point in our life. But I think God invites us for a conversion time and again, maybe every day or could be at least once a month. 
So it is ongoing, conversion is ongoing. And sometimes we also, we have one conversion and a greater conversion is built on that. No, a small, for example, uh, I felt I need to go to the church regularly and I go to the church. Then as I go to the church, I also felt it is not enough to go to the church, but also I need to be service oriented. I need to help people. So I get involved in some activities in the church or in my neighborhood. So certain things are built like that. You have one experience and on that there's another experience is built. So conversion is always ongoing. This is how I would see. Even others can respond to this. Father, may I ask a question? Yes, sure. Father, in life, uh, usually every one of us, we do face very difficult times. So now after hearing this session, uh, which was really nice, what you explained to us, like how we could convert, I mean, look at the crisis moment as something different and maybe God's hand is in it trying to tell us to do something. So Father, during our past uh, like experiences, so we could now, from what you're saying, Father, we could pick out some of those experiences and maybe try and see what is God trying to say to us or get a better meaning from that experience, Father. As you say, making it into a positive thing like where there is something deeper, a deeper meaning involved in that. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Uh, it's also a reflection that you are giving. Normally, when uh, we go through tragedies, uh, we will not look at from a faith perspective. Normally, in general, I'm talking about people, even my life also. Immediately, questions like where is God? Why it is happening? Why my family? Such questions surface, and it is quite natural. But I think slowly, gradually, from why my family, why it has happened, slowly we need to make a shift towards how. But it will take time, you know. Then how in the sense, now with this experience of tragedy, how shall I lead my life? And when I ask this question, how, perhaps here I am not looking from my perspective. I need the hand of God. I need the grace of God. I need the company of God. And so I would say, you no, know, slowly I begin to see now, you no, know, I need to be close to God. You no, know, I need also his help. All this has happened, maybe for my good. Uh, a, a new approach appears in that. When uh, earlier I was uh, asking myself why this happened, maybe I was very subjective. Now slowly I bring that faith element, divine element, and somehow things change in my life. So yes. this is what, hmm? so this is how I would see uh, if you have gone through something and you are raised certain questions, don't feel bad. It was good. But now maybe looking at that whole experience, that hindsight, you might be saying that would that happen? Maybe that failure has deepened my faith in God. Though at that moment, I may not have realized. But now I see that experience has deepened my faith, deepened my relationship with maybe with my family members. So we can have such experiences. Yes, Father. Thank you so much. Welcome. Father, can I ask a question, please? Yeah. Uh, I would like to know how important it is in Ignatian spirituality to have a director and uh, whether this is uh, a possibility here in Goa. Of course, I could have asked Father Roland, but it's always better in a forum like this where others also can benefit. To have a spiritual director. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you the importance of spiritual director and in Goa, what you can do, no, I'm from Karnataka, I will not be able to say much about it, but okay, let me answer the first part of that question. Now, uh, the way I look at uh, the role of a director in this way, now I shared with you uh, the sifting moments. When I look at the sifting moment, no, many things go on within me. Now, let's say something has happened in my family or somebody says somebody is sick in my family and I go through something. Maybe one is very close to me, dear to me, maybe my father or my husband or wife, somebody is sick and so many things are happening. And my children, I know they are far away. Maybe they are not calling. They are not taking care of the father. So you see an external event has happened. Somebody is sick. 
but what you go through is something uh, very different very different in the sense you know there may be a sadness desolation or anger could be with somebody so all those things can happen now what i need to do if i go and share with somebody somebody can help me in that process and there comes the role of a guide the guide will help you as an objective person as a third person who can help you see okay why you are so much worried why you are so much angry can you also see from another angle you no know, see they are also children they may be helping you sending you money but at the same time they are also busy so the guide may be giving you another perspective look at this whole experience from another perspective you might be also raising questions where is god why it is happening and the guide slowly may not be in the first sitting maybe eventually the person may say see also no look at god god is also there he is present there in this whole journey of struggles for example you know you look at the sky and these days we have a lot of clouds here in bangalore and you don't see the sun and similarly when i go through desolation when i go through tragedies it is like a cloud but the sun is behind the clouds sun is present but i am not going to not, not experiencing the sun because of the thick clouds so similarly here you know i may be just hit by this tragedy but remember god is there so this can come from the director and director could be a good companion for me to how to sift between this good spirit and the evil spirit because evil spirit normally takes me towards life destroying choices it can fill me with pessimism on the other hand the good spirit can lead me towards life promoting choices towards hope towards greater faith towards greater charity and therefore the role of guide is very important and i understand for us as lay people you know you also go through a lot of struggles sometimes about the job about the family you have to do so many things when you go to the work day you have to work and when you come back you have got another work taking care of the family you know it is a vocation basically so but so many things go on sometimes very pleasant feelings experience of joy satisfaction on the other hand same day you can have something else also and some people are restless they are upset and even when they see their body body language you can make out something is going on within him or within her and such things we need to share with the guide and therefore the role of guide is very important not only for lay people but also for religious all of us and that's how i would see the role of a director who helps you to discern the workings of the spirit the movement of the spirit thank you thank you father father can i ask you a question sure yeah father uh, how often do you think we should do this initiation spiritual exercises and in annotation 90th annotation or 8 day retreat normally we do once a year yeah uh, once a year if you do it well that is fine we need not do uh, no uh, even uh, what you call retreat in day life if you are doing it it will go on maybe for about uh, you know sometimes 10 weeks or 12 weeks it depends you may not be able to do within 6 uh, days it may go for 6 weeks even that once a year or if it is difficult once a every year maybe once in two years that will be nice and also you need to get somebody to guide you because the guide's role is very important as i said because it is not it is what you pray but what happens to you when you pray that's important you know what yeah. happens to you when you pray whether you are going through consolation or desolation because that is the language of god god is telling me something through my interior movements so this is how i would say i am not able to give you exact answer one year or two year also it depends on the need it depends on the need yeah we do that we do that uh, there are a group of people who do that okay. and uh, but uh, what happens is sometimes uh, the emotions are quite profound mm-hmm. and to discern becomes a problem okay okay so yeah. uh, in that case uh, do you think that uh, we should have a spiritual guide or a director whom we can approach uh, in maybe once in 6 months yeah that will be a very good idea if you have a spiritual guide you no know, who can help you guide you especially to be in touch with your inner world yeah in the world yeah that's that's yeah. needed yeah okay. thank you welcome welcome someone has raised their hands uh, lorenzo mascarenas or 
Uh, Lorenzo, I think you're muted. Yes, Lorenzo, you have that's me. I, I've, I've unmuted myself. I have a two-part question. One is about Ignatius, Ignat Saint Ignatius's exercises, which I'm very interested in, but no, hardly anything about. And my question is: Is there some way I can get to actually practice these exercises? Because right now, all that is being said is wonderful, but it's to me an intellectual thing. And I'd like to be more practical, more aware of what I'm doing and be more exercise oriented, if you know what I'm talking about. And secondly, is it advisable to study these exercises in a group or would it work better if I worked one on one with a spiritual director? Thank you. Yeah, first of all, I would recommend uh, for you to do the spiritual exercises, that's sure. <clears throat> Otherwise, it will be more of an intellectual discourse, even if I take sessions. But if you have done the spiritual exercises, then you vibe with what, what I'm sharing here. Uh, the second part is uh, you know, whether to do one-to-one. -one. First of all, it is better to do the spiritual exercises than to do the study of the text of the spiritual exercises. It could be one-to-one. One to one, or you can do it as a group, provided all of them have done the retreat. That would be nice, so that you know when you when you study, you know what you have gone through, so you are able to correlate with that experience. So that is my suggestion. But sometimes it's difficult to get you know one person guiding somebody, so therefore they prefer sometimes to have a group. But if you are able to get one person who can guide you, that will be wonderful, and also the same person who has guided you, that will be very nice so that he is also able to connect with the text what you have gone through also. So this is my... As a, yeah. a follow-up to that answer, I do appreciate what you told me. It has been very helpful. As a follow-up to that answer, are there any retreats that I can look for or is there any schedule or any information on a retreat that I may be able to attend and how long would it take for that? Yeah, there are... Uh, one thing is we have eight days retreat. That is uh, what we call, you go to a retreat house, go to a secluded place. That's what Ignatius puts it. So that means you do in a retreat house and for eight days you can do it if you want. Normally we do eight days, eight day retreat. But okay. today we also introduce this life, uh, retreat in daily life. Retreat in daily life. That is every day you spend maybe you no know, one hour of prayer, then also examination of consciousness. So that can run through maybe six weeks six weeks or eight weeks. So we can have, no, you can attend that kind of retreat, but you should know where such retreats are given in not in many places. I do not know whether Goa, you are giving that retreat. If you're giving, then you can also be part of it. Along with that, you can also work. But what happens here, eight day retreat, those days you can't work because you have to go to a retreat house and uh, uh, you have to do maybe five hours of meditation or four hours of meditation. All those things are there, yeah. I make this my last. I'm very appreciative of what you've told me so far. Okay. I live in a place which is close to Baga. Okay. And we have a place called Retreat House in Baga. Has okay. this been done there or could it be done there? And could we collect a group of people and make it possible? Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. And <laughs> I'm, I'm from Karnataka. I will not ask anymore, I promise. <laughs> yeah. no, Jorge, yeah. Jorge yes. Roland here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me quickly answer that question uh, yeah. to Lorenzo. Also, at the moment, uh, you may be aware that they are renovating the retreat house yes. and hopefully in a few months, by uh, within another year, it should be ready and we'll be very happy to host you and a group of people for a retreat there, okay? But meanwhile, if you'd like to make uh, the retreat in daily life, Father Furman at Old Goa, Father Patricio in Old Goa, Father... Joseph Cardozo in Porvari, Father Tony De Silva in Porvari, or the fathers at Pedro Arupe Institute in Raya, you're most uh, welcome to contact them, okay? So Is there some way I can get in touch with you, Roland, later or anytime? Yes, come. yes. I, don't, I will yeah. send some information through Frederick and to those participants who are here today, Lorenzo, and he will give information on those who could, uh, would like to, you know, have either the 19th annotation Frederick retreat. Is the guy from Salinao? Sorry, yes, yes, Lorenzo, yes. sorry. Frederick is the person from Saligaon, Norona? Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I have his contact. I will contact him. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you very much. Sorry, Josie, go ahead. Oh, okay, okay. Welcome, welcome.
uh, anyone else who would like to add? If, Josie, if not, excuse me, Frederick, may I say something? Please, please, Father, please. Yeah, Josie, thank you very much. I love, like the four moments, yeah, the way you progressed uh, in the, you know, little itinerant, uh, iterative steps in growing in our thinking, in our spirituality into, from the outside into our interior world, uh, very nicely mentioned. I like the second part, Josie, the sifting moments, no? that was very nice. The discernment process in Ignatius and I was just wanting to ask you whether it would be appropriate to think of the limping Ignatius as the limping analogy for all of us in my experience in the COVID times I found I am limping and so are others the brokenness in myself the fragility of this world fragility of human nature fragility of Jesuits and fragility of people go of goodwill so the more we get in touch with that limpingness the more we become people of the heart. Would that be an appropriate analogy, Josie? Yeah, very true. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice analogy. Thank you. Roland, thank you very much. Thank you. Nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Father. And uh, yeah. thank you so much for everything. Yeah. yeah. Good night bye. to everyone. Okay, yeah. bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Josie. Good night. Eh? Bye. 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 Bye.